So if I, what causes the book to stop? Friction. Okay. Now this is a departure when Newton comes along and comes up with his revelation or builds off the other people. The Aristotelian view that if in, in place for 2,000 years that would be that it stopped because it naturally wants to be stopped. And this was the big turn when you get into, well, in essence, what's now called classical physics. Now, I'm going to put something on top of it that will not tip over. There we go. Take this book. I'm going to try to push it the exact same force that I did last time, and it stopped a whole lot sooner. So the question is, why did it, first off, why did it stop? Yeah. All right, going through the simple. Or the way acting down. Look for the force to start out with. Friction. All right, so we do have more, we have friction here. Now, because it stopped sooner, there must have been, that there must have been more friction. Now the question is, what caused the more friction? More normal force. Okay, and, and that is indeed it. Now most people think it's because there's more weight, but it's not because there's more weight, because this book here, the one that's actually sliding, hasn't changed at all. We have not changed this book. By putting the second book on top of it, the Giancoli book, the bottom book, is pressed more tightly into the table. And the more, the more it's pressed in, the more the friction there is. Now, we measure how tightly these two things are pressed together by the normal force, as Ariana just said. So friction does not depend upon the weight directly. It depends upon the normal force. Now, we have two types of friction here in the classic model. We have kinetic friction, so this is kinetic. And that is directly proportional to the amount of normal force. So if I double the normal force, I double the friction. And it also depends upon the surfaces. For any of you who have ever driven on ice and on asphalt, you know that there's definitely a difference in the type of friction involved. So this mu sub k here, this is the coefficient of kinetic friction. It is found experimentally and yeah, it's not derived. You look it up. If you want to know what rubber and asphalt is, you type in coefficient of kinetic friction, asphalt, rubber, and presumably they're going to give you some table that you can go through and you scan until you find, find it for asphalt and rubber, which I think is somewhere around 0.2. Now, I don't know of any theoretical reason why the coefficient cannot be bigger than one, but I've never actually seen one bigger than one. It is just a number, it has no units, it is just the ratio of this, of the amount of friction while something is sliding divided by the normal force that's at that surface. Static friction is a little bit different. If I push on this table, like right now, is the table sliding? No. Why not? Yeah. Seems to be the answer to a lot of these questions. Now I'm going to push even harder. And there's still friction acting on it, even from sliding. As I push harder and it's still not sliding, what happened? What is the friction doing? Is, uh, is the friction staying the same, or is the friction increasing or decreasing? What is friction doing? Nope. Increasing. Yeah. The friction, if it's not sliding, is going to match me until I reach some breaking point. There is a point at which the friction will suddenly, in which the applied force is suddenly going to overcome the friction and it will get start to move. So the static friction 
will match me up until a breaking point. So it's static friction, so we have a little subscript S there, is less than or equal to USY. The coefficient of static friction times the normal force. So coefficient of static friction. Now to find what that coefficient is, it is also found experimentally, but it is, you, you can't really know what it is until you get to that breaking point. So if I wanted to find the static coefficient of static friction between this book and the table, See how big a mess I can make. So I can just lift this table. Now what's happening here is the normal force is changing as I'm doing this, but also the force down the ramp is changing. But there is a point at which it will start to slide. So if I know what that angle is, I could calculate the coefficient of static friction. So I can figure out what that breaking point, the last angle before it starts to slide, which is close enough to the first angle when it starts to slide. And, and I've done that in class, and you get an answer that usually doesn't seem realistic, but it, the way that it is done formally is very similar to that. They just have more precise equipment and more better measuring. So in problem 4D, I put you at that extreme. I put you for the maximum static is equal to us times y. I put you at the, that maximum speed so that it won't slide. In other words, the centripetal force is at maximum static because go a little bit faster, it's gonna to start to slide. And so I give you the mass of the, of the vehicle so you can find the weight. Since it's flat, that's my attempt at a car. Since it is flat, the normal force is acting up, weight is acting down, friction is acting off to the left or right, whichever, towards the center. You can find the weight, you can find the normal force, then. And so you have that, that you found in part C, and this will solve for that coefficient. any friction questions in the four or five times we said. Other questions at the moment before I talk about what I originally planned to talk about. I done the, I did not hit Scott. Who's in? When I was teaching middle school, last time I taught middle school. And that was the last time I teach middle school ever. I, I was doing something similar to this with that group. 
And and I will say, I did get closer to hitting Scott than I had anticipated. As I swing it around, I let go and the thing goes flying. Uh, but that was the first period. Last period of the day, someone comes in and said, Hey, Dr. Fox, I heard you had Scott this morning. No, I did not hit Scott. I've never hit a student doing this. The closest there, there was an accident the first semester we were doing this. We didn't work using the rubber stoppers yet, so what we used for a mask on the end of it was uh, some of the, the metal masses, the, the discs with holes in them that you could still put it through, and the string broke. And I was sitting here, and they were twirling around like that over there, and suddenly there's this against the board because the string broke and this piece of metal goes flying through the room. <laughs> so fortunately, no one was hurt. But physics, it's a dangerous sport. <laughs> so if I'm swinging this around like this, and I want to hit the door, at what point do I let go? It's when it's over there? Yeah. When it's like, I think it's when it's in front of you. It has to be parallel to the or perpendicular to the door? So when it's back there? Yeah. All right, so we got there and there. And in front of you. And in front of you. And it's up here. Wait, wait. Which door? <laughs> so wait, when I let go of the string. That's a good question. Yeah. So let go when it's over here? Mm -mm. Like to the side, but then it's going to wrap around that way. All right, so, sorry, at what point do I? Side of you, like in. I mean, here? You're doing it from my so point of view? I'm doing it from your left side, so, but the other arm, right, this left. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let go when it's over here. Sort of kind of a little bit towards the back, yeah. I don't know. So somewhere around here? Yeah, it depends if it doesn't hit the board, but I don't know. <laughs> All right. Now, let's try it. I'm scared. Yeah, if I, if I think I'm going to hit a, if I think I'm, I'm going to release it and it's going to hit a student, then I would ask you to move. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to slow it down because I, I do want to have some control here. Yeah, otherwise, if I'm spinning it too fast, you know. My accuracy gets lost and they know I'd ask you two to move, but I'm gonna do it more slowly. So you at least should have an idea of the sense of which direction it's gonna go in. So I'm gonna let go first when it's in front of me. Yeah, this one students get nervous. How much faith do you have in me? <laughs> um, Actually, I think you were safer where you were. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that was <laughs> we moved that way. <laughs> or back. All right. Three, two, one. Safe. One trial safe. It's in the box. It's in the box right here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Next one, I'm going to release it when it's over here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> I think more I have to hit myself here. So, I'm going to, so release it when it's here. Three, two, one. Why don't I go over just slightly too Under the table over here. And then there was the behind me. <laughs> I think I have enough control. Let me actually face this direction. <laughs> It obviously went towards the door. But it <laughs> You want, so first off, you want it so that the door is, door to circle is a tangent. Door to circle? To circle. All right, so just do an overhead view of it. So like the tangent line would be perpendicular to the door? So if that's my circle. <laughs> I'm 
they should use the permanent markers. We'll take them further away. There we go. All right, so there's my circle right there. It's a thing spinning around, and I'm trying to hit a target over here. I want it so that basically, so that the door to the circle is a tangent. As I'm spinning around like that. Inertia is about an object wants to keep doing whatever it was doing. The only reason that it is not traveling in a straight line, because it's not when I'm spinning in a, in, in a circle, is the fact that there's tension in the string holding it in. Every time it tries to get out, the string just pulls it right back in. And that was for all the Godfather 3 fans out there. So, once I let go of the tension, it no longer has anything pulling it towards the center, and so therefore it should travel in a straight line. Now, it does drop down because there's still a gravitational pull on it. So, now, there are a couple of misconceptions. Some, what, some of the misconceptions is that it wants to travel in a straight line, there needs to be something to make it go straight. And also the fact that once you let go, it will tend to start curving around like that, but it doesn't do that. Once, it, once, that, once that force lets go, it will you know, travel directly. Is it because you're forcing it to go into a circle? Absolutely. And that's why it doesn't curve? It just goes in a straight line when you let it go? Uh, instead yep. of curving? Yep. And that force that's holding it in is the centripetal force. So in this particular case, the centripetal force was caused by the tension. For the purists in the group, it was caused by a component of the tension. Or for the car on a banked curve. So if, that, if I have a curve like that, this is a rear end view here. If the car is going into the board, if it's traveling in a curve, then the net force has to be in that direction. And it would be caused by part of the normal force. Because the normal force is in that direction, perpendicular to the surface. And part of that normal force is pointing towards the middle. So part, so the component of the normal force is what causes the centripetal force. And that's actually an answer to one of the homework questions from the textbook. So anything traveling in a circle or in a curve, there has to be some centripetal force causing it to change direction. Because F equals MA, the force, the net force has to be in the same direction as the acceleration. So an object that has a centripetal force experiences centripetal acceleration, which is pointed towards the center while it's traveling in a circle. Going back to the linear motion lab, that last page of is it possible for such and such and such and such. There's acceleration if there's a change in direction. That acceleration from change in direction is the centripetal acceleration. And it happens to be, there's more math than uh, 110 students typically want. But if you worked it out, the acceleration, centripetal acceleration, is equal to the speed squared over r. Spend slightly more time on that. If you're on a car going around a curve, the things most likely to cause your car to start to skid a little bit or to squeal as you go around the curve. Well, actually, on some of my cars, just turning the wheel causes it to squeal. But <laughs> for you to you know, slightly drift a little bit, if you're going too fast or if you're taking too tight a turn, it's much easier to take a turn like that than it is to take a turn like this if you're going, say, 50 miles an hour. So it's much easier to take a turn doing this at 10 miles per hour than it is at 50 miles per hour. That's what's sort of bundled into this. The fact that it's the speed on top, so the faster you're going, the harder it is to do, and the radius is on the bottom. The larger the radius, in other words, the more gentle the curve, the easier it is. If you have a tight radius, a sharp turn, R is small, which makes the fraction big, 
means you have more centripetal acceleration, which means more centripetal force is required to keep you actually in that curve. So, like going in a circle, if you are doing it smaller, it would have a higher radius, and if you're doing it bigger, it'd be a lower radius. If ask that again. So if you, I don't know how to say, like, I guess if you shortened your string and made it a smaller circle, you would have a higher radius? No, if, no. If you shortened the, the circle, mm -hmm. you'd have a smaller radius. But because the radius is smaller, we've got a fraction here, making the bottom smaller, that makes the whole fraction bigger. Okay, okay. And so that's what I was getting towards. So... Because it'd be harder to keep it smaller than it would be larger, right? Or no? Yes, okay. yes. And you can sort of feel this and you'll, well actually you play more around with speed in the lab, but as I'm swinging around like this, there's a certain, I can feel some pull on my hand when I'm doing this. But if I made it smaller and wanted to travel in a circle, I can feel more pull in my hand than yeah. I did before. Okay. Now. I couldn't do this exact same speed because I'm not that talented, but hopefully you get the gist of it. Yeah, yeah. So let's do one example with it. So this is a side view, and then overhead view. I have some mass here, I have some mass there, so let's just make this uh, three kilograms and make this one kilogram. So this is my one kilogram mass here. Traveling in a circle at, uh, let's make this radius two meters. So that's a really big table. That's a table? Yeah. <laughs> oh. This is the over this is the overhead view. Oh, okay. Oh, 